All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So this is joint work with uh, my student Theodora, who is in the audience, uh, with uh, Shiki Sen, Shweta Sinde, and my colleague at NUS, uh, Pratik Saxena. So let me start, I guess, neural networks typically don't need a lot of introduction these days, depending on what news uh, you follow and uh, which of the AI preachers you follow. It looks like uh, there won't be any reason for human existence in next 10 to uh, 15 years or so. But at the same time, because we got very excited about these networks, so we started applying them in all kinds of interesting scenarios where we humans have been doing pretty good job and then we start applying these neural networks and I think Sanjit mentioned quite a few examples. For example, you want a neural network to recognize some digits on your car plate, so you make it a small change and then suddenly it says, well, this looked like zero, but now this looks like five. You make a small change to three, so it says this looked like three, now it became eight. You make a small change to yield sign, it changes suddenly, so, or to the taking a left turn, it changes the sign. So, this is very concerning because typically most of the people are able to drive well without getting fooled by these signs. Then we started looking at applying neural networks in other kind of interesting scenarios where we would like them to be able to make uh, decisions like um, can we release prisoners and uh, if they are going to again commit crimes and uh, we use these neural networks and it seems like they did what um, we used to do uh, mainly in US about 100 years ago, which is that you look at the race of a person and uh, you decide that uh, if they are, you know, brown or black, then they should commit more crimes. So, although we have moved on, but neural networks seem to have the similar issues. Similarly, you take these neural networks for face recognition and you find that all it was trying to do was to guess what kind of specs you are wearing and uh, if someone else is wearing a specs, of uh, maybe from what a celebrity typically wears like the specs, then these neural networks are going to make uh, lots of errors. So this is a lot of very concerning, I guess. Uh, but at the same time, for a long time, neural networks were really not used for applications where um, the decisions they were making would have a lot of long-term consequences. So this is kind of the one of the first times when we are using AI in scenarios where if it makes wrong decisions, it can have a lot of impact. And this requires us to think about how we are going to verify these networks. Of course, we are not the first people to look at this problem. There has been a lot of work in the past. Sanjit talked about a lot of interesting ideas. I don't think I will have time to uh, discuss all the prior work. But broadly, from the verification community, we wanted to uh, look at this problem the way we typically do the verification of uh, software and hardware systems, where you have a network, you think of that as a model, you have a property and then you would like to design a system that should say answer yes or no. So let me look at this into one of the uh, applications that I talked about. And in that case, what we want to know is that we want to use the system for one of the applications where we would like to predict if someone is likely to default if, they, if I give them a, a loan or so. So in this case, what this would look like, you have a set of features assigned to every person and then you change the feature, for example, if you change the gender, then most of us would agree that changing the gender but having the same feature, same income should not make someone uh, be more likely to uh, default. And this is kind of, uh, if, if a neural network turns out, gives a different output, then this would be very concerning. So, we look at most of the systems, this is a very popular data set, you look at the system that are trained and you quickly most of, uh, there are lots of what is called adversarial attacks and they are usually able to find such examples. And this usually creates a lot of uh, news in media because then suddenly someone says, well, this network uh, will make a wrong decision. At the same time, if you realize, it is not like humans don't make wrong decisions. It's that we want to design systems that often don't make wrong decisions. So the existence of one counterexample is although a bit surprising because we expected these networks to be far better than us, but that does not imply that we are going to stop using these networks. If you think about, you find an example and you tell this to the designers of the systems, then they say, well, let me try to fix it. They have different kind of defenses, but 
eventually they are going to we are going to use the systems that are highly accurate as long as they don't often make such kind of mistakes so the notion of verification that uh, we have stuck on for a long time we are given a property and a model we want to find whether there exists an execution of this model that does not satisfy the specification that is kind of bit outdated for the uh, design of this machine learning systems because if you go to an ai conference no one ever claims that their system has 100% accuracy it would almost be uh, very laughable if someone comes and claims that we achieved 100% accuracy you get very high accuracy so you expect that these systems will not make mistakes all the times but that does not imply that these systems will never make a mistake so this requires us to look at this problem from a different notion and this is what in uh, this work we precisely set on set on to do which is to ask that how should we define the verification problem and then the techniques that you can use to uh, quantify this definition and so on so i am going to discuss that in particular what we want to know is that for how many such individuals such a case is going to happen because if it is only one case where you find such a bad instance then you can say well i can use this system and i can be aware of you know one or two bad cases but if the network makes such mistakes very often then you will be very concerned to use it so how do we uh, check how many cases it's going to happen one try is that well how about for all the different features we have we can keep changing the values from male to female and change all the different features that as you can see very quickly is not going to work very well because in that case we are going to uh, try have to try out exponentially many so what has happened is that we have to move from this notion of does there exist one such configuration to counting how many and as i'm going to discuss that this requires new techniques so uh, i'm going to discuss three contributions in this work this is kind of the first paper we wrote we have a follow up paper and there's a lot of work that needs to be done and i would uh, really like to invite you to uh, join us try the tool collaborate with us so i'm going to discuss three things first this notion of quantity verification i am going to quickly formalize it then i am going to discuss a procedure to estimate this correctly and then i am going to discuss uh, how we use it for one class of uh, neural network that are very widely used these days in particular cases where energy of uh, is of lot of concern okay so the first question is we would like to quantify this so let me formalize this what do i mean by the uh, quantifying so let's say for given this network let's say rf is the number that says how many times it makes such mistakes we would be happy with uh, computing this number exactly is usually very hard so we would be happy if we can compute this number within some epsilon factor with confidence at least 1 minus delta these are the two parameters that are decided by the user they can say how much confidence they would like and what tolerance they would allow to do okay so we would like our estimate which is within 1 plus epsilon factor so this is a to tolerance with confidence 1 minus delta both are these quantities specified by the user okay um so as i discussed earlier that uh, but trying to do a quantification using very kind of naive techniques is not going to work because if you really try over all these possibilities then there are two rest to 99 checks and that's not going to finish i think mate has uh, enough specified that there are too many there are very few items and there are too many possibilities so i'm not going to go there again so also if you just try to use very statistical techniques then the monte carlo methods usually cannot give an estimate that is theoretically sound so we need to go beyond uh, being able to use very kind of uh, simple techniques monte carlo techniques is what sanjit discussed for a, uh, another class of problems where it turns out to be a fairly simple problem and in that case it might work but typically monte carlo techniques don't scale which we have seen in lots of other cases so our approach is that we can reduce this problem of uh, quantity verification getting this estimate to that of model counting so i'm going to discuss uh, the problem of model counting is that given a formula you would like to count how many solutions are there okay and how do we do that well we start with the neural network we have a property we convert both of them into a formula which we call a specification then now to compute this estimate would require us to do counting over the number of solutions of this formula okay 
So let us get started. So let me discuss uh, more about how does this encoding work. A quick question to ask is that will we be able to do it for all kinds of neural networks and that is a very interesting challenge because neural networks are typically highly nonlinear, involve constraints over real variables. In this case we focus on one class of neural networks which are binarized neural networks. In these cases uh, what happens is that the features are all binary and in inside every layer you finally compute a binary number. And um, another thing that is very interesting about these neural networks is that they are very compact and would typically are far less energy hungry. So they are being um, in comparison to traditional neural networks uh, which are very uh, require a lot of energy just to run these uh, systems. So if you are going to implement neural networks and systems like embedded devices or phones then these are more uh, the likely candidates for implementation. Uh, lots of groups, we do not design neural networks, but the groups that design neural networks uh, for example from at uh, Montreal from Yoshia Bengio's group, so that has been working quite a bit on these neural networks. So these are candidates that are going to possibly be uh, implemented in lots of devices around the world, so we would like to concentrate on these networks. So what do these networks are? You get the binary inputs and the outputs are going to be binary. There are three, two kinds of layers. There is the internal layers and then there is the output layer. So I am going to discuss every internal layer is composed of uh, typically in neural networks you have one multiple layers and each of the layer has three parts. For binarized neural networks there are three parts of these layers and these are you have first the linear layer then there is a batch normalization and then binarization. So we are going to go into all these three in slight more detail to show you how to encode. One of the most important thing about using uh, <coughs> techniques based on site is that the encoding matters quite a bit. We are going to see more of that tomorrow. So in this case coming up with the right encoding uh, was uh, in fact most of the work because if you naively encode then we quickly see that these techniques won't work. Okay, so how does every layer work? Well you get set of inputs and the first layer is trying to compute the output of each of the layers is a dot product with the these are the parameters. So corresponding to each of the edges they have set of parameters and the x's are the inputs and then there is some additive factor bi ok. So you take the dot product and you sum uh, this with a given value ok. So this is the first layer so this is the linear layer then we we had to do batch normalization so this is for a long time we have figured out that you do not want to compute you uh, there is some underlying distribution and you need to shift it. So without going into too many details what I would say that this is kind of a linear shift. So you have these parameters mu and sigma with alpha and gamma. So you do a linear shift of these values that you have computed and then the third thing that you do is to uh, binarize these values. Remember uh, one of the important things about binarized neural networks is that these three layers are inside every block you can think there are three layers and all of them are kind of viewed as one unit and in fact there is a lot of work on how to do these three operations uh, very fast. So finally we got binary inputs here xi's are all binary plus 1 minus 1 or you can think of 0 and 1 and then we would like to output plus 1 or minus 1 ok. So to do plus 1 or minus 1 you check whether the value of this ti is greater than or equal to 0 in that case vi is 1 if it is less than 0 then vi is minus 1. The reason you like to do this operation of plus 1 minus 1 is more to do with the numerical computation they turn out to be faster. You can do things like Fourier uh, fast Fourier transform and all to do these computations. We do not have to go into these details but I am going to show that plus 1 or minus 1 is just really the boolean value 0 and 1 right. So we are going to that, do that transform ok. So this is the internal block and then you have sequence of these blocks ok because these are of course again binarized ne neural networks are deep for reasons that probably machine learning experts would be uh, able to explain better than me. And then you have sequence of these internal blocks and then we look at the final block. And the final block again has two parts. So the first is a linear layer. So again you do this dot product plus something right and then you take a arg max over these quantities. So essentially the way to view is that for the classes that you would like 
you get an estimate of what we think is proportional to the probability and then you take the maximum of the values and you output that to be the answer, okay? So this is kind of a very standard neural network yeah, inputs, every layer computes some values, finally you get a big vector and you take the maximum out of that. So very standard design of this neural network. So how do we do a go about encoding? Well, let's look at the encoding and I'm going to discuss the encoding that uh, works the best here. So we have set of these weights and this bi's, so these are the way uh, the whole system works is that someone gives us the, these binarized neural networks, you go through the training, so you get all the weight parameters and these other bi's and uh, these linear transform parameters. So now to encode each of these ti's is to say that we, are, we want to take the uh, dot product plus bi, so this becomes a uh, what is called pseudo boolean constraints, we are going to go in more details tomorrow. So you are taking the dot product, so you, tip, you would typically have some coefficients, in this case all the weights are 1, 1, 1, so you get x1 plus x2 plus x3 minus bi, which is 0.2, uh, 2.0, okay? Then the batch normalization layers, so let us say these are the parameters we learned, so in that case we are going to multiply them with you know 0.8 plus 2. Okay, so this is the second layer where we are going to uh, do again another linear transform here. We multiply all of these values with a factor, then add something. And then the binarization is to really look at the case where you say, well, if this is greater than all of these values, I just did a bit of rearranging because I would like to know if this is greater than or equal to zero, then it should be, um, the output should be one, otherwise minus one. Okay, so this becomes more like a mixed linear integer programming problem and this is the first encoding that we looked at and turns out this was not a very good idea. So uh, what turns out finally a very small observation that you can reduce this problem from mixed integer linear programming to integer linear programming uh, by taking the ceiling here seems to have a lot of impact. So this is kind of one of those exploration where you spend a lot of time and then finally you realize one afternoon discussion makes all the difference, right? So it's very important to figure out how to encode it properly. So encoding at the ILP is a very key here because if you try to encode as a uh, mix into the linear programming, then um, these constraints uh, when we have to feed them to the set solvers become hard to handle. To go from binary to Boolean, this is kind of again a very standard uh, transformation. You can always look at plus one, minus one. You can transform those. You would uh, like to say that if the value is zero, then you give the, um, you want to map minus one to zero and plus one to plus one. So you do this very standard transformation. So finally what we get is, uh, we get, uh, in this case, we are getting every coefficient is one. Um, and then we finally get a cardinality constraint. Now we need to figure out how do we encode this cardinality constraint into CNF uh, because typically the solvers uh, that we had to use to do the second stage which is to count require into CNF encoding, yeah. The coefficients are also one minus Yeah, coefficients are also one minus one. Otherwise we will have to do pseudo boolean here. So if we want to do general then we will have to do Oh yes, you are right, yeah, that's an important part. So I think yeah, one part here is that to be able to do the ceiling requires that all the coefficients are plus one or minus one, okay? Okay, so in this case what we finally get is a cardinality constraint where you want to say greater than equals to or less than equals to depending on how we are encoding all of these. And so remember you finally get something like this is a cardinality constraint greater than equals to some threshold should imply that the final output is one or otherwise minus one, right, okay? So this is kind of the most important part about the talk that how do we encode it uh, and we spend a lot of time in kind of getting this one inside that we should be taking the ceiling, otherwise we were getting um, very slow performance. Well, these constraints finally become cardinality constraints. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the way you can think of is that, let's look at this way, on the right hand side we have, which we are going to treat as zero or one, so we have a Boolean variable, 
on left hand side we have a cardinality constraint now we have to encode all of this into CNF formulas. Um, so, we need uh, some way of translating these into CNF formulas. So, what kind of property do we need about this translation? Well, in this case we would like to make sure that when we do this encoding because finally, we are doing going to do a model uh, counting of the number of solutions this encoding should preserve the number of solutions. This is actually a very different uh, notion from the earlier studied notion where you would like to preserve the satisfiability. For the whole day when we were looking at formulas we wanted to encode so that we can preserve the satisfiability. In this case we would like to preserve the number of solutions. Turns out that the site in encoding that uh, which is very widely used can be uh, which Mathe discussed in the morning where you introduce extra variables preserves the number of solutions as long as you project all the solutions on the original set of variables. That is one case, but uh, this is turns out a notion that is not very well uh, widely studied because uh, this allows us to look at other kind of encoding that preserve the number of solutions uh, and to understand that what kind of encodings would be better for counting. So, uh, there, there has been a lot of study in encoding that are that preserve satisfiability and their effect on satisfiability solvers, but not so much for counting. Okay, so finally, we get this formula in the CNF for form, right? We have the inputs, we have the output, we write some constraints, different kind of property that I am going to discuss and then we would like to compute the number of solutions. Remember, since I have defined all the variables inside, the only free variables I have are the inputs, right? Because every other variable is uniquely defined, so I do not have to worry about rest of the variables. The only free variables are the inputs. So, I, I have described a function in terms of inputs uh, that gives output to this uh, neural network and we are going to write a property in terms of inputs and outputs and then we want to compute the number of solutions on the inputs. As we know that the problem of counting is usually very hard, so we rely on the approximate notion here where we are interested in getting epsilon delta guarantees. So, we would like to get the PEC guarantees here where we want to compute the estimate within 1 plus epsilon guarantees. And then this allows us that all the three steps are sound, so the estimate that we are computing is indeed sound. So, let me now jump into the um, diff empirical uh, results that we did and uh, we looked at three applications. So, the first application those are the three same application that I started the talk with. So, the first application was about fairness which is whether uh, the neural network uh, is fair to different individuals. So, there are lots of notions of fairness and it is again a very uh, hotly debated topic. In this case uh, the notion that we looked is the individual fairness where you want to say that if you change someone's attributes the sensitive attributes of someone like um, gender or race then you expect that uh, the output of the network should not depend on the sensitive attributes right. So, we would like no kind of discrimination based on you know race, gender, um, and so on. So, in this case we uh, we took a very popular data set this is the UCI adult data set. So, this is the data set about uh, uh, people from uh, Taiwan and uh, what they you would like the network to predict is if they are likely to default or not given loan ok. And we wanted to know that how well the neural networks that are trained on this data set do in terms of uh, being able to um, if, if we take an individual and if we just change their gender then how does uh, their per, uh, outputs change ok. So, ideally you would like that output should not change if you change the gender right. In the ideal world you would say that if you take if you take this very accurate neural network and if you change the output of uh, if you change the feature gender from male to female then you would uh, expect that the output of the network should not change. So, we can encode this problem where we say that let us say we have x 1 and y 1. So, we are looking at two individuals uh, one is male and another is female and they agree on all the other attributes. So, there turns out to be 66 attributes and we would like we ideally we would like that the output of the neural networks are same. We can also start looking at different kind of cases we can say that well how many cases where x 1 is male and the output of the network is high and then you go to female the output of the network is low uh, which in this case it is discriminating against men. In this case we can look at a different way where we say that you change the gender from male to female, but the output goes from low to high ok. So, this framework really allows you to uh, express lots of different questions where you say that well 
I would like to know in how many cases there is a discrimination against one gender versus the other. And uh, not only about gender, we can look at the marital status and we would uh, again expect that the network should not be looking at someone's marital status to make uh, their prediction. So here are the results. And the main lesson that I want you to take out of this is probably not about these different architectures, but about the what the uh, tool that we have developed that we call as NPEC allows you to compute these different numbers. I am going to discuss what all of these numbers are. So in the first case, we were looking at that, remember we had, let us go to this case about female to male. So we wanted to know in how many cases the output remains same. So it turns out 90 percent of the cases. In how many cases you go from high to low, 9 percent of the cases in how many cases you go from low to high, okay. And you can look at different architectures and you can see that their numbers actually vary quite a bit. One thing I want to highlight is that if you look at the accuracy of these uh, uh, architectures is about the same. So you would not be able to see this kind of difference. But now when you apply the tool, you actually get very different estimates. And this can give, raise a concern because you might think that let us say this architecture seems very off because it seems like it is giving preference to one gender, okay. You can do the same kind of uh, question for another attribute, maybe a subset of attributes where again you would like to compare this estimate. Yeah. It depends on in your data set whether you have data points where all the other attributes are the same yes. and only the gender is different. So uh, this is a verification question that we are handling. We see that someone designs a neural network and asks us how well it does about the fairness of you know different attributes. So how do you fix is a complete uh, is a different question which is that now you know that these are the properties of the uh, this neural network. Oh, so, so the count may include cases which may never appear or something. Yeah, that is very important because just for the data set you can compute the numbers very easily. Remember we want to look at. So for the data set they were fair? For the data set I do not know how are, what happened for the data set. We, we do not know about the data set how, yeah, I think we were looking at what happens overall. But so the most important thing in our case is that we are able to give these estimates. What you do with this is um, another thing that can you use this to uh, improve it. I think what Sanjit mentioned yesterday is that um, maybe they found cases that it was never trained on such cases. So that may be one reason that why it is being unfair. So. Uh, the diagnosis is a completely different problem, not uh, what we are concerned as so far. Fair amount of variation across architecture. Yes. So that is kind of a very surprising thing which you typically do not see when you just look at the uh, accuracy. And the other aspect I think I would like to highlight is that in all these cases the number is greater than 0. So the fact that you say oh I could find for each of these a different counter example. If all you were looking is what is called this adversarial attacks where you start with a network and you say oh. I could find there exists such a case. For each of these, you find such cases. If you were only looking at the satisfiability problem, the only answer you would get is yes for all of these. You would not see this uh, variation that is giving a far more richer picture about all of these different architectures, right? Okay. So now the second application that we looked at is uh, this robustness application, where what you do is that you start with the image and you want to understand if I make a small perturbation to this image what happens to the output, okay. And um, I showed a case where if you make a small perturbation then the output can go from 0 to 8, you know. So uh, again you can encode this property of robustness. Remember we had the neural network encoded right in CNF, now we have to conjunct it with the properties. So in this case you can encode robustness by saying that you want to look at two in inputs x and y which differ at at most k bits and you would like to again count the cases where the outputs of x and y differ, okay. So you are looking at two inputs which differ on k bits and you would like to compare in how many cases it happens that they give different outputs. You can also fix your x. You can say that I would like to understand for this image in how many cases it is the, for how many small perturbations of let us say k bits, it is the case that you will get a different output, okay. So this formulation is fairly general, allows you to express different kind of properties you would like to do. So again, what we wanted to do is that we got lots of different architectures with uh, different um, defenses. So again, this is kind of a cat and mouse game. Um, people come up with the architecture, they say that these are very robust and someone comes with an 
attack and then uh, they come with the defense and we want this tool to be uh, again able to uh, <coughs> measure these architectures, right? So we are not coming up with a defense, we just would like to uh, allow the developers to be able to understand how well they are doing beyond this example of on one case. So again we see this kind of very different uh, interesting picture and if, uh, which is again giving a very diverse picture where you see that for different architectures and for different defenses you see that the number of examples uh, again vary quite a bit, okay. So if you are just doing the kind of the traditional attacks which are just to ask oh for this network can I find one individual then uh, for all of these cases you get the answer yes. But that does not tell you that, you know, architecture 2 has too many attacks compared to architecture 3. So this is really being able to quantify how well it does uh, generally. Then the third application that we looked at uh, was this Trojan attack where typically you uh, train your networks with, you know, some set of images and you uh, find that the networks do well in performance then uh, the, an adversary comes in and they poison the data set a little bit and uh, this poison is you, you change the data set a little bit maybe you add something that the adversary uh, thought would fool the network and then what you do is that you put some bit of a backdoor so that you can fool the network, right. So you know that what is a small backdoor that you put in and that would fool the network. So this can be used for all kinds of uh, security applications where if they know the backdoor then they can get the network to behave in malicious manner. Maybe after at this point the network uh, sends your private data and so on. So this is kind of a very popular attack, this is called trojaning. So again, this allows us to uh, ask the same question, once we have the neural network, we can say that for different kind of patterns, for how many cases the network is going to give different outputs, right? So that allows us to quantify whether there has been a trojan attack on this network or so. So usually there is a small threshold where you say that the network will behave weirdly if there's only, you know, for if the network behaves weirdly for very few cases that might raise a concern or if it behaves for way too many cases that might raise a concern. So people in security domain have different actions to do once they can compute the numbers. So again you can express this as a property where you are given some pattern and you would like to know in how many cases the network is going to output to some given uh, label. So again what we discover is that these are the test set accuracy of these networks and these are the uh, cases where the network is behaving in an adversarial manner and you can see that we get a far richer picture. Uh, in this case weirdly, interestingly enough um, this seems to correlate with the accuracy so which is kind of an interesting behavior. Um, I, we do not have a lot of explanation that why it is happening in the case but using this allows you to again get this far more richer picture then getting an answer yes, yes, yes for all these cases. Okay, so overall just to put the picture about uh, the underlying tools because we are using this approximate counting tools uh, that use XR uh, handling and all that Mate talked about. We are right now able to handle binarized neural networks involving about 50,000 parameters um, and <coughs> Here is kind of the general picture, so we had about 1000 uh, such formulas and we find that we can within about 8 hours we can handle about 90 percent of these formulas but as you can see that we still take about 24 hours and still not be able to handle all these formulas. So there is a uh, lot of work that needs to be done in how do you come up with efficient encodings and how do you scale these techniques uh, further. So with that let me conclude, so I talked about three things, the first is uh, we need to go move beyond the notion of qualitative verification where we were just concerned about does there exist an execution where the model does not satisfy the property to of quantifying how many such cases are there uh, because the network that are being designed are not being designed with 100 percent uh, accuracy. And this requires us to look at encodings that are uh, you would like to preserve the number of solutions and that allows us to ask that. Uh, again go back and ask question that how their performance of different encodings uh, um, of a cardinality constraint uh, have impact on the underlying uh, counting techniques. And uh, right now we can, we showed that lots of different properties, all of them can be encoded into this general framework and we are able to uh, handle binarized neural networks with about 50,000 parameters 
that is certainly far from where we would like to be. So, this is kind of the first work. Uh, we just submitted another work where we are able to handle far larger networks, but still a lot of work that needs to be done. The code is public. I would really encourage you to try it out, give us the feedback, or uh, we would be very happy to collaborate. With that, I would like to conclude. I would be happy to take any questions. So, uh, in your experience, are there any kind of networks with some specific uh, structure that you can take to your advantage, such as symmetry, for example, or other things that can help you with all this robustness and other questions that you uh, encountered? Uh, I think yeah, for the underlying tools, there is a lot of opportunity because we had to really look at these encodings and try to understand. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of symmetry because there are lots of layers and their weights are usually uh, fairly similar. We are not able to take advantage right now, but I think this would be one area where one should be able to take advantage in terms of scalability of tools. Uh, we are really not machine learning experts, neither we aspire to be. I think our job is really to help the designers that uh, um, uh, if we can help them as a verification engineers in, in order to understand that how it is performing and give it to them to figure out uh, how to improve the network. So, at this point we are really focused on uh, doing the verification part, which is that someone designs a network, they think that it is fair or they think that it is robust, we would like uh, to give, uh, tell them how well it is doing. Yes, uh, how do you encode exactly the fairness property? So, the fairness property, there, there are kind of lots of different f uh, formulations of fairness. This is yeah. called local fairness. So, where you would like to say that. Well, I, I wonder why isn't it that if, why don't you have uh, the conjunction, if all the, uh, the labels are the same, then the output should be the same. So, you to have an implication instead of to have the whole conjunction. So, we are interested in the cases where the, are you saying that both, that would be taking the negation of this, right? So, it depends yeah. what, what, well, what I mean, it, it depends you what you want to, yeah. to check. So, that the reason why, so is the, is this a property that you can derive from your formula? And then I think this is how you, you use an implication. Oh, I, guess. I mean both are same. So, you say this implies n x equals to n y. So, in that case you would get in how many cases it is indeed, yeah. indeed the case. This would say that in how many cases they agree. So, you would take the negation of it, right? You would say n x not equals to n y. What we are saying is we are looking at n x not equals to n y. Yes. Right? And then we want to do n not of this which is really n x equals to n y. You could also look at a different way where you say that in how many cases okay. they are equal. Okay. The both are, the other is the complement of this answer. So, Kuldeep, uh, you've been talking about, you know, the count of adversarial inputs for a given property, mostly in terms of that. But if I vaguely recollect, your method would actually allow us to even uh, uh, estimate distribution of the adversaries uh, on the feature space, right? Yes. So, and that would be a much more deeper insight. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, one thing that I uh, forgot to mention the formulation in general, you can say that I would like to uh, um, understand under some distribution because you can say that some kinds of inputs are very unlikely, so I do not even care about. So, the formulation, of course, allows you to, in that case, we would be talking about the problem of weighted counting. The scalability of tools is the challenge here that right now uh, being able to do weighted counting for these networks is a, a real challenge. So, in theory, yes, in practice a lot of work that needs to be done being able to scale the tools. So, the formulation, yes, the general formulation that we describe in the paper is that you would also like to understand under some distributions, right? Because you know that what kind of distributions you care about and for example, you can write more uh, other kind of constraints that in this country, um, you know, females are more educated and I would like to understand under this distribution. So, uh, how do I quantify it? Scalability of tools is quite a bit of challenge right now. So, the number of variables is uh, linear in the number of neurons or parameters or something? Um, number of variables in the in your formula. cardinality constraints. In the final formula that you are giving? Yeah. In the so, they are linear in, uh, in if you just represent everything in the cardinality constraint, 
then it depends how we encode in CNF. I see. So we get about, you know, looking at different ways, we get about an order of magnitude, actually about two orders of magnitude. So we started with about 50,000 parameters, we end up with so millions. So I mean, wh what, is it the number of parameters or the number of intermediate variables at the neurons that matter? Uh, that is the number, the number of parameters so is exactly. Each neuron could have more than one parameter, for example, if I am using ReLU or something with. So the uh, parameters are the weights, WIs, so these are exactly. But the weights are fixed, right? You are taking a given network. Yeah. So why should the, so for example, if each neuron had 10 parameters. Yeah. That does not change the number of variables. You are still interested in what is the, how is the output expressed in terms of the input? Using well, it depends because whether you, the weights you learn after a network, so whether it is plus one, minus one, what exactly the constraint you get, right? No, no, you are taking a trained network. Right? Yeah. So all the weights are fixed. Yeah. They are constants. Yeah. All parameters are fixed. Yeah. So what matters for you is how many variables you need to encode the input as it is getting processed as it. Yeah, so that encoding really depends on what is your threshold and those threshold really depends on different parameters that you have for each of the layers, right? So uh, uh, the question you are asking so is are that cardinalitic. symbolic in your thing? They're no, not. no, they are not symbolic. Yeah. The encoding from cardinality constraint to the CNF, um, they try to take advantage of because you are writing sigma xi greater than some threshold. And that threshold really depends on how these parameters are given. And that kind of blows up uh, the encoding uh, to final CNF. So uh, it's not that, well, we can get an upper bound which is n log k if you say that the threshold in every case is n, so it's n log n will be the upper bound in theory, which is not a very good news because log of 50,000 would make us about uh, 20. So in that case, we'll have to deal with million variables each of the problems. Yeah, I'm just under, I'm just trying to understand yeah. that if you want to scale it up to bigger networks yeah. with similar thresholds, let yeah. us say. So is it, I mean. Is the hardness, um, is the question that where is the hardness here in the problem? Yeah, I, I mean it, it looks like it's the, whatever, the density interconnection of the network <laughs> that matters more than the, I mean the, thresho the thresholds do affect the encoding, yeah. but that is because you have a specific case wh which yeah. depends on threshold. Yeah. I could use something else, uh, right, I, mean, I could use some other function. So I think, yeah, so the way people typically think of parameter is plus one, minus one or zero if one of the weights is zero. So what does not affect is how many, if, if you would like it to be more sparse, uh, the sparse network would probably be easier for us to handle, right. Um, we had to really do a lot of, I mean, at this point I do not know where the, if you ask where the hardness is coming from is because this encoding is really blob. So it's, it's really the case that we deal with these formulas with millions of variables uh, where the inputs are very small. So the XORs you put only on inputs, but the formula that you deal with is very, very large. So in forward propagation this is a very simple problem. Once I give the values of inputs, it is very easy for the solver to understand. But remember the properties encoded on inputs and outputs. So it's really the circuit that becomes very large. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.